It's like Welcome to another session of the Network Seminar Series hosted by the uh, Center for Network Intelligence at the Robert Bosch Center for Cyber Physical Systems, IFC. Today's talk is by Professor Madhav Marate, and he will be speaking on a computational theory of graphical dynamical systems with applications to social technical networks. Professor Madhav Marate is a distinguished professor in biocomplexity, the Division Director of the Network System Science and Advanced Computing Division at the Biocomplexity Institute and Initiative and a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. His research interests are in sustainability science, network science, and computational epidemiology, AI, foundations of computing, and high performance computing. During his 30 year professional career, he has established and led a number of transdisciplinary groups. Recently, his work has supported federal and state authorities in their effort to combat the COVID 19 pandemic. Before joining UPA, he held positions at the Virginia Tech and Los Angeles National Laboratory. He's a fellow of the IEEE, ACM, SIAM, and AAAS. Before we move on to the talk, we would like to request the audience to subscribe to our Google Groups for information on future talks. You can also visit our website for more information. And uh, we have arranged for high tea at the Coffee Hut, so please join us after the talk. And for the finally, we request the online audience to please keep yourselves on mute and unmute yourself for any question. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you smile? Yeah. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the organizer uh, for hosting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to see here the familiar faces. Uh, hopefully, you enjoy this talk presentation that I have prepared uh, today. Uh, I must also start by thanking our group, uh, these folks here, for uh, much of the work that I'm going to talk about today, and also folks from IIC who are an integral part of the group. I, I, I really know them. I like this. Uh, it was a very remarkable work. She is a young student, and it was a major student. Professor Ravi has been here a long time back. He did another recent. Uh, but thank you very much again. So, what we study in a nutshell is, uh, is networks and large networks. So, networks that have, you know, between 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 14 uh, you know, particles of agents in them. So they're not very small to do straightforward analytics. They're not so big to use means and models statistically. So, the ability of networks is in matters. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, the slides are not changing here at the Zoom. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. I don't Sorry about that. I wanted to give you a folks a brief uh, introduction to our group and the work we've been doing before I jump into some details. Um, I when I started working in this area for about 1994, when I was a co-traffic fellow at Los Angeles. And uh, as I said, we've been focusing on very large programs that lasted for a long time. And I say this because usually work like this uh, is best done when you have a team and, uh, and continue to work to produce fairly good science along with this. So transit to the program that I participated in, and I see this in the second part of the project on urban transport planning, Chris Barrett with my colleague, we did. We started uh, back in 1992 before I joined and continued to one. The NISA program is a program that was set up at Los Angeles and San Diego National Labs after the 9 11 incident. 
and it is aimed to start studying interdependent research system. And the focus was that time on um, understanding, planning, and responding to uh, large scale disruption, the short term disaster. The NIH MIDAS program that is going on, and right now, actually, Anil is a part of the project. Uh, is the project uh, that studies infection disease You know, the first you know, groups within the NIH program, uh, of you here know what we for Houston's work, and uh, I know Jimmy's work, and Don Burke's work. They're part of that group. Uh, when we move to the DETEC, we have a program called SEALS, uh, which is a close cousin of NSEC, again, studying the large scale disruption, and then the program called OSI open source indicators that try to harness uh, data from the web to try and produce predictions. So, all of them, the goal has been to do data driven Gaussian model uh, in, try, in trying to understand systems and support policy. So, this is a brief uh, background on transit, and then we'll go on to the technical part because you'll see the, the project that drove this. It's only at one work right now. But transit was established to solve uh, uh, problems of national importance. And uh, when it was set up, there are two motivating examples that transit uh, used to, to, to start. One was uh, an act by EPA that talked about uh, emissions. And uh, the issue was that uh, EPA had passed the mandate for cities to control emissions in, uh, in uh, cities. But, Turned out that the typical four step model that is used in urban transport planning that uses zone to zone flows was not adequate. And the first reason was the zone to zone flows uh, capture average speeds of vehicles. And much of the emissions are not a result of average speeds. the start and stop traffic, the cold starts that we have. So, for instance, if you want to understand emissions in India, all the traffic jams we see are uh, really a big contribution. Uh, the second reason was social justice. You know, who builds the highways or when should highway be built versus state roads and who benefits from it and who doesn't benefit from it. So that was the reason why, why transit was established. But the key parts for transit that made it interesting was it was done in conjunction, which is the way we have done most of the work, in conjunction with policy makers. We first worked with Albuquerque Metropolitan Planning Office. And with the Dallas World Book Planning Office, and then finally with the Port Metropolitan Planning Office. Because then it made sure that the question that we were working on, the extensions we were working on, were relevant to policy makers. And this, in my opinion, was important. Later on, Transcend became an open source system. Uh, Algon National Lab maintains Transcend. They've certainly modified a lot of people to use 40 plus case studies across various. Uh, uh, I mean, in fact, I think some folks at IIT Madras are also not possibly here. But I think it's a good system. It's changed a lot in the past 20 years, but I think the core idea has been the same. For instance, Transcend highlighted the need for agent based modeling to study growth. And before that, largely people would not use it. Now it becomes standard process. So, one particular study that we did, I just got my lighting, and this was highlighted because. We participate as, as, a, as a part of the team, not the leader of the team. But in 2005, there was a, there was a proposal to try and close, and it has been closed since uh, a perimeter around the White House after 21 events. And um, multiple scenarios, interventions affected on the language of pandemic planning were cancelled, like building tunnels, having new metro stops, you know, bike lanes. Uh, so that the way it was used, this transcend basically simulated traffic in, in uh, Washington, DC, and put these interventions in place and then studied water analysis. Uh, it took about five, six years for the project to complete. Uh, they finally did something relatively simple because the expensive uh, aspects of building a tunnel was just not uh, just not financially viable. But the important part was the scientific work that was done provided with some basis for understanding. One key interesting aspect of transit was to try and capture what we call latent behavior. So you all know that you know we build these systems, and typically the way people do this is uh, you know, if you look at the road that is jammed or has something on the flow on the road, measure it, you do a simple projection, and then you say maybe I'll add a lane, and then perhaps uh, you know it will get better. The problem is it doesn't capture behavior 
which is late to do that. Once the road is built out, many more people start moving on it because they can satisfy it. Actually. The transit was built where people want to achieve a certain set of goals during the day. So adding the road made it easier for them to achieve that goal. And so you saw new new uh, set of traffic uh, patterns emerge because they were certainly not possible. Simple measurement would not. So the main point is if you have a model that purely is based on the data and project forward, oftentimes doesn't capture the causal readings that can get. I'm not saying that it's not correct, but point being that is an important part of the story. So what this highlighted to us is the need for an interaction based approach to it. You have to understand models at a certain level of details, and interactions are important. And models allow us to think about the problems differently, and, and that is important. So for instance, in the case of pandemics, OD models have been, uh, have been used a lot. And on the other hand, these network models will allow you to understand certain class of interventions that are not possible before. So this is all I'll talk about in terms of introduction, but I will try and talk about the mathematic treatment that we have, uh, a theoretical program that we have running in conjunction, uh, which tries and understands the class based systems. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that every theorem in this is not directly used in practice, uh, but I think it provides us with a very nice understanding of system and often tells us the boundaries of our understanding so that we can we can form the design system better. So in the rest of the piece, most of the talk now, I will talk about this. In the end, again, I'll end with the example of competitive science. Um, so the model of, this is called graphical dynamics. Folks here are done graphical games. Almost all of you must have been a heard of the learning talk about graphical games uh, in their talk. So these are graphical dynamics. Maybe a good cousin uh, for a graphical case in the course as well. And the basic idea is very, very simple. So I've kept the model really simple. You can add. A more expensive business and this problem will get harder. The idea is motivated from similar parameter stack structures, uh, which was done in the same So you have a graph, uh, each node can be thought of as an agent, and each node has a domain about the state that the node can be in. And the uh, intent is that the node also is in line with the function. You can see what, what the case we have here. It will see a log function log and an x log, uh, and and uh, that describes the basic system. It does not the dynamics. So the dynamics of the system, uh, in a system, in a system states are being updated synchronously. is very simple. Every node looks at its state, looks at the states of its neighbors, runs the function of this collection, and updates its log. That's it. In an asynchronous system, like say when you have computation of order, then you can go node by node and do the same option. So that's all this model is. Very, very element that is kept that way because the mathematical treatment already starts becoming quite hard with this simple model. Right? So any questions as far? It's actually a very simple model. It's a direct extension of the automata, very deeply connected to communicating finance machines because the, the finance machines are less of the function at that point. But the graphical structure is important to hear. So here is an example of it. We won't go into details, but the important part in dynamic systems is the concept of phase space. What phase space captures, much like folks here who try during machines and configuration spaces, is, is an exponentially large, large graph that each node now is the instantaneous configuration of the system in the space that the nodes can be in. And a directed edge between two nodes. If in one step, let's say to say to the subject, move from that state to the next. So in the deterministic system, each node has exactly one edge that is coming out. You can have multiple edges coming in. So the number of edges basically equals number of nodes, uh, because one per node. And it's a directed graph, this, uh, but it can have cycles, when you be cycles. So the very many, many concepts that are prevalent in the system can be applied. Now, this is basically the crux of the problem. What you have, if you have this in a probabilistic part, then I'm going to talk about it later on, you get a mark of change. And much of the problem, I don't need to look at this force here, comes from the fact that the presentation of a of the system is side and not. And uh, much of the complexity is to analyze a system that is exponentially larger again. If that was not the case, you could solve, in fact, the mark of change, you could solve some problem, change, problem. 
So we'll just to get the so theory going, we'll largely talk about two class of functions because those are the ones we understand well now and we can use the theoretical treatment, but they're also useful in fact. It's one a threshold function. And each node has a simple threshold function. The threshold function is one where you are zero till some number of nodes which next to you are zero, and then you transition to one, so far as the number of papers are than equal to one. You count your own state at the part of it, or you can choose not to count. Symmetric functions with extension, where your state you now zero or one just depends on the number of zeros and ones you have. So, so they like extension. Both of them are very small to take. Our symmetric functions we define in a paper, we call the extend symmetry by breaking the number of inputs to our classes and then each part is relatively simple. symmetric function. But we probably want that. Last concept that I want to introduce. Start with this notion of synchronous updates and a sequential update. A synchronous update is something we talked about. A sequential update is one that you're given a specific permutation or order on the place. So you go through that permutation over and over again. You can choose to go in some other set schedule if you want, but that will change the results on the We'll use this format to define the thing, which is find the first part in the domain, second part in the function, and then y would tell us s y would tell you it's synchronous, it's the synchronous part. One question yes. uh, two, two slides the previous slide. Yeah. So, here, the, if you look at the threshold function, mm -hmm. uh, that also only depends on how many of the inputs are one. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a threshold for that. Effect. So, why isn't that called as a symmetric? It is a threshold, a, a substrate of symmetric function, but threshold once, let's say if you put threshold of five, then if you have six neighbors, it's still one. But symmetry, you can go up and down. Oh. It's just the total number of zero and ones defines your state, but the state can become zero and one. It's not monotonic. The shoulder are monotonic. Right? So this could be a, uh, that's the real, yeah. But it's, but it's a very important question. I will play this in uh, the These are terms you must have heard. Uh, for dynamical systems, folks, they are known, but if you have not done dynamical systems, the garden of meaning is a configuration. Uh, you know, where you know you there's no predecessor, right? things are just coming out, there's nothing coming into it. When six point is nothing but a state where you just stay there right to reach. Okay. So far, everything deterministic, and we'll go through for a while on the deterministic systems, and we'll then go to probabilistic systems. Later, as you can all imagine, when you've done work, similar work with this probabilistic system, that much harder to work with. So, even with this simple system, and I'll come to it, these are. Good models, in fact, the work by Nanowater, Central and Macy on social campaigns are actually very direct forms of this. There's nothing different at all. We thought we had done a nice survey paper by Bellman on connecting this to Asian based multi Asian systems, Asian based world. Graphical games are part of it, and also the you know, coordination games that Feinberg and Jackson have discussed in their books are nothing but this kind of dynamical systems. And we'll be in touch on it. So it's a simple model. Easy to understand, but fairly general form. And you can add Benson's. You can make the function not zero one function, but you can make a lot of arbitrary function. You can make it a stochastic function. You can choose to have directed graphs. You can have hypergraphs. But those extensions, in terms of theoretical treatment, start becoming interesting, but usually harder. So we'll talk about three class of problems, four class of problems. I'll touch on the first and the fourth today. Uh, and then uh, later on, people are interested, I'll tell you the kind of question we studied for second third. But structural problems does just ask about some properties of the phase. Does it have a fixed point? Uh, does it have a cycle of length two? Does it have a garden of real state? How many of them exist? Right? These are just structural features. Uh, design problems is design a GDS with certain properties uh, of reserving phase space. So, very nice work by Petruri and his group on designing this. For how few networks, which are actually a subclass of this, which can be used for storing memory. So, self stabilizing protocols, you know, transfer systems can be thought of as an example of, of this thing where you design a system to stay stabilized, where if you do small perturbation and the system comes back to the same phase point, it can be thought of as a design problem. Or make concurrent optimization problem, vaccine allocations can be thought of it as deleting edges of nodes in the graph to achieve a certain goal. Would be, a, would be a part of it. An inference problem is you observe the phase space and you try to infer the components of the dynamic system. 
So those are the four classes. There could be other, but this captures the basic stuff. And as I said again, the hardness comes because the exponential side. But all the theoretical treatment, at least for me, and the computer science to do with the computation resources that are needed and structure theorem that come along. And my colleague Christian Widers and me look at it from a mathematical standpoint, an algebraic standpoint. They look at structure that. So, um, to set up the mathematics here, our goal is to really understand these basic questions from the computer system. What makes this problem easier? When I say easy, I mean for the platform. Can we come up with sharp boundaries between India and That's a dichotomy that computer scientists are interested in. Famous one by Schaefer and Panchal uh, When are two GDSs equal to assuming the number of So, Milner and others have talked about simulations and vice versa. So, these are the questions that everybody studies. But the key is we have four things to worry about the problem variable network, but the local function, the update rule, and the graph. And we are trying to understand this, these questions. As a function of one of these three parameters. That's basically how the theory is set up. Um, so, in our work, maybe I'll, 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 I'll go through this by this example itself. Uh, first, tell you that these simple objects that I talked about uh, can become universal machines. You can prove this for any complexity class, but you have to make the function progressively harder. Zero one systems can only be largely in NP, the, the way it is, but by making the functions more complicated or making the graph infinite, you can actually introduce undesirability inside with us. But essentially, by adding this, you can actually get every level of the complexity graph. So they are, they are even though they are simple, they are fairly powerful from a purely computer standpoint. It also show you that oftentimes you cannot reason about the system without simulations. Okay, we get harness with us. And then it shows some interesting trade-offs. Uh, very nice work initially by Dr. Uh, and Cyclis uh, and Conway and others. You see. So, let me take a couple of examples, quintessential ones, because they are so basic to dynamic systems and formal uh, theory. That we use. And you'll see some interesting outcomes. I won't go through every detail. Um, so, we started this program back in 98, and it's sort of a side uh, story for us in a large measure. <laughs> But there's a lot of interesting work. So the reachability problem, those of you who don't know, is very simple. You're given two configurations, S and T, and you're asked whether the dynamical system starting at S will ever reach T. You can say it's any reach T in number of steps. Okay, uh, that's the reachability question. If T is a fixed point, then it's a fixed point. Anyway. Can it reach a fixed point? And that's basically the question. I have had. So this is the first theorem, and we'll talk about it. A little bit in terms of how one would go about doing the case. I want to hear directly. So, what we show through a series of papers is that reachability is, is hard. Uh, now, understand that the notion of number of steps has to be given by, given unity, you know, reachability is easy. It's a deterministic system. You can just control it and get it right. So, hardness, and this will come later on in probabilistic systems. So here, reachability is always talked about in terms of the number of steps. If you're given SMT, this T could be far away because exponentially many nodes, then there's nothing to worry about. So the key point here is that the problem is P-space hard, or in, in, you know, P-space hard, even when all the nodes compute the ident an identical symmetric moment function, the fixed permutation is okay? And the graph is extremely simple. In terms of Constant degree on the nodes suffices and constant bandwidth on the graph suffices, not even the full tree bit itself. The band. Uh, it's that simple a structure that suffices to get harmonic. Uh, on the flip side, this is the dichotomy. It's not the strongest dichotomy, but it is a dichotomy. If you make the node functions to be pressure functions, then the problem becomes easy. And I want you to ponder a little bit. So, the, the key now is that by changing symmetry to threshold, you get easy. 
and easiness result has greater flexibility. Every node can compute different threshold function. You don't need a strict ordering. So, for instance, fair schedule, you work out, and graphs can be any graphs. It doesn't have to be you know, any boundary structure. Too. Yeah. So that's yeah. So you go ahead. Okay. Uh, it turns out that in fact, uh, and we'll talk about it later on. The reason threshold functions things are easy is for the following reason. If you start from any configuration, and then we do a little bit of talking about it, you can essentially reach a quasi fixed point, either a fixed point or a small unit size. And that's why the result is. Okay? But this will not happen first minute. So, in some ways, what's called transients in these systems are short. So, yeah. Yeah, so, see this slide. so, what is bandwidth here? So, the bandwidth of a graph. Uh, from the is uh, defined as follows. You lay out the nodes on a straight line and give them integer values, think of them coordinates, and you join two nodes by an edge, if you have an edge between them, and if, if the two nodes, one is at number k and one is at number l, then l minus k is the length of the second. The maximum of this is called the bandwidth of this layout. Bandwidth of a graph is the smallest layout that you can get. Effectively, so it's like uh, if you look at the graph and look at the cut around it, then the cells the edges don't go too far from, from where they start. Uh, it's a turns out the graph that is bounded bandwidth also has got bandwidth bounded treatment, which is a structural property which is tree line, so much more restrictive form. So, bandwidth problems are used in computer science because VLSI layouts in one dimensional. And this property. So people are interested in cuts in this. So that's how the term came about. This is and a fixed point is an absorbing state. Fixed point is absorbing, exactly. And quasi fixed point is just limit cycles of fast and flat. Exactly. So, so it's like the threshold functions, the set of states itself, which can be reached, is somewhat limited. Is that intuition correct? No, of course. Uh, it is a subset of symmetric functions. Set of every configuration, of course, you can always start there. Right. So it's a phase, it's a phase phase of every all configurations are always in phase space. It's just that wherever you start, you reach an absorbing state very, very quickly. Finitely many steps. In fact, all number many steps. In some sense, I was uh, the intuition that I had was that with the short functions, mm -hmm. the uh, things that you can go to from let's say there's a fixed test for both kinds of problems, mm -hmm. starting state, but Maybe the uh, why is the second problem with the short function somewhat easier? Uh, right. I was just trying to get a theme for it. Yeah, so I'll come to it. But just a little bit of hint is it turns out to be a Lyapunov style argument, a potential style argument. Every update leads to a lower potential defined correctly. And that takes you down to the problem state. Maybe it's not the best answer, but that's the mathematical way of thinking about it. Other way for me. One way to think about it is this monotonicity in the short allows it to not oscillate as much, but that's not a just an intuitive thing. I was just wondering if the set of states you can reach from, let's say, a fixed test, is that less rich in some sense? Compared fixed to test, we can only reach one state because a deterministic system will only have a path. Okay. Right? So, that in a non deterministic system, we have branch, we have no branch, only input branch, input algorithms can only have. Hey, this is only whether you can reach or not in our steps. Yes, yes. Yeah, so this is the interesting theorem itself. You, you know, I want to at least touch on how you would do harness proof because there's actually the paper accepted acceptably and now we've done a directed graph, very nice done. Um, but you start with acceptance for Boolean for, for a linear model machine. But this part is very, very important. You, you know, we have sequence of essentially transitions. That go and make it into a finite domain system and get into Boolean systems. Uh, the sequence, and here we have to add the, you know, the ordering part needed and then make all the functions identical. Like each of the sequence, I'm just one the, the classification. Yes, you could explain the P space hardness for some of us. Okay. Ah, okay. So, people who know LP hardness, okay. so P space are very similar, but the, you're talking about the space complex. So, your starting machine is a Machine with a fixed amount of space. On. So, a linear model machine is a machine with order n space. On it. 
So it captures the space complexity of the problem rather than time complexity. And there are well known results between empty and empty space, contained in this space, but we don't know what, you know, straight, straight property of it. So it's just a complexity class. I think people believe it's harder in some ways, but uh, that, you know, the formal part makes some of the easy. Uh, the reason it's P space R rather than just empty hard is because you have exponential time, you have to keep going forward too. The other part I wanted to talk about, at least for um, computer scientists and others, is how reductions are done. They are done in what we call local and structure preserving ways. And you get a basically you get a morphism. Every time you take one instance, you convert it, you have morphism. You walk on this for one step, you have to walk maybe multiple steps here, and then you have morphism. And the value proposition here is you can think of this as almost writing a compiler where you take a node and compile it down to a simpler and simpler and simpler instance. So that the, you know, if you wanted to put this on the other side, there's a very nice paper by, by physicists to talk about the CA compilers. Then this can be thought of as compiling it down to a normal form for the system, any 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 object you're given, then running it. So if you wanted to run a, a Something of a chip, you can design it on a, a universal architecture that write a series of transformations that bring it, bring it in that form. So, it's from, from a computer science standpoint, this kind of reductions are interesting in for the very structure preserve. Thank you. So, that's why the bandwidth is preserved. You start with the NBA with a straight line effectively and keep changing the node structure locally. Right. I won't go through the proof for easiness, uh, but basically, it turns out the Rather interesting connection of this to the Shapley modular potential games and fact lacuna functions. And a proof like this was used by Hopfield essentially for neural networks too. Neural networks are weighted pressure. And he also showed convergence for neural networks essentially with a similar proof. Goals and others have also used a similar proof technique. But effectively, this is one of the few proof techniques people know to try and show such, such convergence. So you define appropriate potential. Here the potential is some property of the node and some property of the edges, and then the potential of the configuration of some of these two things, and then you show that each step thing reduce and reduce by a finite amount. In some interesting new proofs, other people have done, they don't reduce every step, but they reduce enough in every n step. So average potential goes down. In our case, it reduces by two in terms of in every step. So we won't go through it right now. I kept it in the slides so that you can know, look at it. So this this property really is it's a so in the reformulation of the minor order Shapley like proof the difference is there they only talk about convergence they don't talk about time this one potential starts with a polynomial you know, value in an M, and it goes down by two every time in that case so it's a roughly you know, for, you know linear number of steps that it starts right that's the interesting question. What is the potential function in this? Yes, I should tell you. So the potential is defined as following P1 of V for a node V is the smallest integer such so that V must be a side one, even of its of these neighbors are one. Okay. And P0 of V is smallest integer so that V must be a side zero, in zero of, of these neighbors are two. So let's take an example. Here uh, let's say every node contains a two threshold. The first thing says it's T1 of X is two because once you have two neighbors assigned value two, it is going to force you into, into one, regardless of what happens. The second potential second part says it will be forced into zero if three of the nodes are neighbors are because now its own value can only add one to the value. So basically, this tells you. Uh, what is once this is done, your potential is effectively the state is effectively done. The so the potential of a node, if it's in state A, is T of A of B. The potential of an edge is one if the two nodes are not in the same state and it's zero otherwise. Okay. And now the potential of the configuration is the sum of these. Now you argue that when if the node shifts. You know, one step and one step is only one node moving. In, in, then one step, the potential changes because you move from say, zero to one. Effectively, you know you're going to lose some energy in terms of cooling it down. So that energy of works out quite well. 
And it's reminiscent. We are not the first that come, and we just came up with this particular potential function that we use. I want to take just a minute to uh, mark on a very important regard by Cannon and, and Lipton uh, on linear systems. But I think people here have done remarkable work in linear systems. So a linear system said that updates can be thought of as a matrix multiplication of data set. You start with state, multiply matrix, you get the next state of the system. So the question is, if you want to know where a system is after t time steps, then by doing uh, recursive doubling, you can actually do it in one of the time. You can keep jumping, then jump the next bit, so write the thing finally and do it, right? But if I say whether S can reach T, that problem we thought was non-trivial and we thought about it for a while, but then turned out we just said, don't look at this, the, the literature well, the beautiful JCA paper by Tandon and Lipton on, on basically showing that this is indeed doable. Because they call this orbit problem in dynamics. It's really remarkably interesting stuff. It's just that this is my fallacy of search where you know, I was just looking for fixed points and then the systems and graph. And they named it as orbit problem, and I never stumbled upon it until I just stumbled upon it. It turned out with another, forget the person's name, Oxford, he's done remark. So they actually took it one step forward. Rather than talking about reaching P, you can think of describing the set of possible states by writing uh, a function, right? So they can now you can think of P instead of P, you can think of all possible states that can be defined. Uh, Using vector space. That's how they started working. So this uh, is connected to a very deep mathematical question. I forget. And uh, this person at uh, at Oxford has made good progress on it. And I want to talk about it aside because even for linear systems, this is an open question, and to study this well, basically. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm happy to do this. I want to connect it quickly to games. It turns out this update scheme that I talked about can be talked about in. The world of evolutionary games. Here. So I don't know how many of you have looked at evolutionary games. They are not standalone ones, short games, but you basically play the game over and over again. And every time a person updates their state by looking at the neighbor state, and the utility is derived from that object. So you update only you if you use the utility. Typically, people talk about best response strategy games. Uh, people have used it in many other cases. It came out in biology, but that's a better way to describe it. But how do norms form in social systems was well, one place evolution games got used. You know, you don't want to just study bash equilibria, you want to study how an equilibria might come to, come to be, right? It's called straight dynamics. So it turns out we can jump, jump to it, but threshold systems that I talked about are exactly coordination games. And anti coordination game, which also study, turns out to be. Uh, inverted functions. So again, this was an interesting connection that our results for dynamical systems interpret correctly could say something directly about these evolutionary games itself. And I'll talk about uh, two uh, two problems that we studied. It's going to appear in the AI this year. One is existence question. Given an evolutionary game, does it have an actual user and can we find it efficiently? Convert it. Given a game and initial profile. Will it converge to a limit cycle of length to so cause a fixed point or a mash equilibrium? Uh, sorry to interrupt yes. that uh, screen is not visible now. Oh, okay. Somebody is Sorry. I've given three talks in three days and I've seen completely different problems and I've not figured out. So, conversion problem is what we studied just now. We think that I'm going to say. Okay. So, the first problem you need to talk about the existence of Nash equilibrium. Second one is reaching a Nash equilibrium starting. They're different, and you'll see why. 
So this observation is that coordination games threshold parameter systems and the coordination games are inverse expression. So I just want to tell you what result we get for the threshold and inverse expression. So it turns out, so here the interesting fact first. By thresholds, we can show that the system always converges to a fixed point for uh, inverted thresholds, anti coordination games. We don't have, we don't know the result. But what we know is you can actually get limit cycles at exponential R if you construct it as That doesn't mean that uh, I, no, you can reach something about it, but we can show that the system does have long cycle. In threshold systems, I wish we had question, you don't have big cycles ever. So here, you know, if you start, get stuck, you know, you're not guaranteed. You might get into a big cycle and then just put it on the ground. So it turns out that other than this last part, these two systems actually can be the problem can be solved in the in the form of the time. But this result I want to show and maybe won't do justice here quickly, but let me try and argue the difference between existence problem and the conversion problem. So these let's focus on just these two columns. The first one says that you do the update where you <coughs> Take into account your own state. And in this one, you take the, the update, or that one is extended the one you take into account your own state, and the other one doesn't take into account your own state. And it turns out that while the convergent problem, things don't change. Whether you take your own state into account while defining your utility changes the complexity for finding the utility. One of them can. So these are the results that you know, today I paper. Uh, I think the main observation is that these coordination games and anti coordination games are just special cases of, of this dynamic system. There's a nice PNH paper by Ramsey and others where they looked at it. I think folks here are experts in Markov games. I mentioned this. If you update asynchronously, where at each step some subsets of node fire, and you can choose the probability P of fire, uh, they showed for anti coordination game that almost surely you will be It's a nice, nice proof. Uh, I'm trying to see whether there are things can be used to directly do the proof now. But that is actually a nice way to think about asynchronous systems. So I'll quickly touch on this last class. Um, uh, let me stop. Uh, at least want to mention the results. In the inference problem, what we are going to study in this model is a little bit more than a sandwich. But I think uh, this is the best we have done so far in terms of understanding. The idea is you observe the dynamical system and you try and infer the graph or the local function that make up the dynamical system. So there are two different observation models, right? Observe the thing from a distribution or fasten the observe, let the system keep going and then see what the state producing. Or you do an active win. You basically give you a give your state to the system, it'll output the next table system. Depends. That's one that's one and Successor of that <coughs> So here you know the node states. That's what you call as the phase space. No, so what you know, you're given this black box. This, you know that, and, and the two results. Let's say for now, the graph is small. I know that the nodes, and then the promise as I come to it is that the functions, local functions, come from some from this class. I want to infer these local functions. And I'm only going to give you these partial observations. And after some number of observations, you tell me what this is. And the partial observations are either uh, pair states. Pair state. I will give you the first configuration, so 0, 0, 1, and you say 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Okay. Okay. So that's the whole configuration. All you can see the entire sequence, but you don't know the graph. Or you don't know. So this is pairwise. You can say the observational forms are just going and see, and complexity change. So, first of all, as you can intuitively see, some cases you need. Exponentially many observations can occur state. It's not surprising, but we construct examples. Right? Um, but it turns out and I'll, I'll, that using active learning approaches, you can actually learn the system somewhat faster, essentially polynomial in time. So exponential speed up. So in active learning, you can give it a particular configuration and output a configuration. So in an active learning phase, you know, you can choose to give the next query based on what you've seen thus far, 
in a bad world, in a vacuum thing, you don't look at what it tells us. You just say, here is a bunch of things I'm going to get. So it's a weaker model of query. Active query is stronger. You're very smart as people smart about asking the next question. But, and you can imagine that it will be better in some cases. So here it turns out that these queries sometimes actually do very well. There are many, many examples of this in machine learning. So the results for, let's say if I tell you that all functions are symmetric functions, but I don't tell you what the function is. And I don't tell you what the graph is. And I, and I told you to, to, to infer the functions, the end function that you're doing. It turns out that by very interesting relationship of this problem to this suit coloring in graph and using that effectively, you can bound the number of queries that are needed to infer the local function by roughly max degree squared. So essentially, n, you know, n squared. That's it, right? So you, you can really cut down on the number of queries you need to infer the local function. So, and this is guaranteed for symmetry functions too, and to the, to the uh, threshold functions of the time. Beyond symmetry, you can show it to my take exponentially any queries through this. What was more interesting, and this was a paper by ICML, and we were surprised as well. Um, Anil and Abhijim and others were part of this paper. And then, actually, you don't even need to know the graph. Okay. In this particular situation, you have to infer both the edges and the local function. And you can still pull it off in roughly you know, small number of queries uh, this, this system is, for thresholds is asymmetric. So this was really surprising for us that even when you don't know anything about the system by just being smart about asking the query, we can cut down on the, on the time takes to find the system state. So uh, I'll, I'll go through this fast. I wanted to touch on the probabilistic part, but I see that we lost time. So try to stop and make five minutes. That's okay. We lost a little bit of time in the middle. The probabilistic version, because it's useful for contagion models, really the same model, but now the states updates. The interactions are given as probabilistic functions. So here's an example. The SIR model for disease dynamics, most people here know. So you can go through it first. You toss a coin and infect a node uh, with probability P, that's P is the, the number I've given here. And uh, what it gives you is this large uh, form of chain infection. So most people here have studied this. But we started this other paper, we just had a PNS, uh, studied the following problem. So people have been doing forecasting, we have been doing forecasting for a long time. And the big question was, can you try and prove something about this forecasting system? So we made the problem really simple. We said, you are given an SR system and you have a subset of nodes. You can think of the subset as all the nodes. An integer Q and another integer T. You want to compute the probability of the number of new infections in the set S. Basically, number of new infections in the car. At a given time, is more than so. Right? And the second problem is by different times, which are integral of all the infections that, that have happened by that. The last one is to compute the property of the peak number of infections after a particular time. And there are more and more problems paper has. So see this, what is given here is essentially you're told that the system starts from a particular node. No non-determinant. You've known what the graph is. The only but part that is random is this toss point toss. And yet, it turns out that the problem of finding these results often time is number t half. Okay. Now, in some ways, it's a reachability question that we discussed. The big difference is there, you have to sort of go exponentially many steps before you find the hardness result. Here, if you want to predict something, even after two time steps, the problem becomes hard. So the un un unpredictability of the system comes in very, very early. So you can tell where the system would be after one time step, but you can't really compute what happens uh, to the system beyond t greater than equal to t. And that was the remarkable part of that. In fact, it turns out 
that it holds even when the probability of transmission are identical or not. Right? So the idea is not that anybody is going to do this proof, and it doesn't say that we should not do forecasting, but it tells you fundamentally that doable forecast using network models is not going to be easy to do, or you to take into account some special stuff. In fact, we even took it further. We showed power law graphs, low dynamic graphs, don't have a top. Any question? I think this is an important result for us because you know nobody had been studying the forecasting problem from a complexity standpoint. And I want to again stress that this doesn't say that we should not work on a practical problem, but at least people who claim that they can do it all the time correctly, certainly unlikely or they discovered such a the problem that they're not aware of. Uh, the flip side, if you only want to look at fixed time and the subset of nodes is also fixed, then by reducing the problem to counting of DNF formula, I think you can appreciate, you know, can't move it like better, can be used to do this counting. Basically, you report the sampling and you count and count it approximately. So FPRS. So I think this is this is the part that was uh, was interesting for us. This is, you can do inference problems also in the this. Is it good that yes. I didn't follow yes. that. So you said that this is a Markov chain now. Hmm? And you are in a particular state. If you are one state with very special values, one node sick, all other nodes are, are susceptible but not sick. Yeah, so some state. And you want to say what will happen after two steps. Mm -hmm. You're saying that's hard to do, it's just a, a, a product of, of the expansion probability matrix. Why is it hard to do? Why is it hard to do? Yeah. Because if look at the question that is being asked. The question is the, the number of new infections is what is the number of possible ways you could have gotten infected. Large, that's why. Very large matrix. Very large matrix. Yeah. That's the point. Then all of the problems is because the chain is large. If the chain was you know, small, then you could have done it. You could say reduce the weakness system by product. Chain, but very large chain. That's exactly what. But as I said, surprising part is exactly these two types. So the other result is a deterministic system. You know, you can unroll it and get this results only by exponential time. Here, two steps was what made it very, very interesting for us. This was interesting because we could, if you want to infer the probability of transmission, the point of, you can infer it again by a method that we have problems. So we have shown now how this theory now can be mapped onto problems in epidemiology, various questions. So as I said, directly theorems might not apply, but a very good close correspondence between the class of questions that I talked about and problems in epidemiology. We can do the same thing with social and theory too. Only reason I put this here was it is that theory has some value in terms of understanding system. It may not directly say something about particular system as it is. I'll take just a few minutes to talk about these agent based models for epidemics because it's something that has consumed our time. And then quickly go through it and say what we've been doing. Because uh, Rajesh knows it, and Siva knows it, and Vijay knows it, but others, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Niesh, you've seen this. But we have been working on pandemic planning and response, just like you folks from March 2020. And uh, now 80 of us have been working with this uh, the team. We've done more than 75 papers now and more than 150 now, weekly updates to our models. This has been ongoing work with a lot of people. We've supported a number of different agencies in the US. Uh, we work with uh, folks here to do the forecasting for Indian context. Uh, but we are the lead modeling group for our state, just like you folks have for Karnataka. And it's been a very valuable experience for me as a scientist to work on it to please help shape the policy. We're not policy makers, but certainly provide time. Uh, you know, I want to show just two slides because I want to tell you what, what we did. Um, we've done these four modeling, vaccine application, vaccine distribution, testing, quarantine, social distribution policy. One of the things that was successful for us, very early on, and that led to us doing it. Was a state wanting to set up field hospitals to uh, try and treat patients? This was back in April, May, time frame of 2020. And if you all remember, Javits it was created in New York City, and they also had a Navy ship that was docked to treat the patients. Uh, and then they also this was being discussed. So we were asked this question, and because Washington, D.C. was due to be a pretty very risky place, and uh, they were ready to. Try and build these hospitals. Our models 
suggested that uh, Washington DC cases are not likely to be that high in time, especially with, with social distancing measures that have been put in place. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, people were initially not sure, but our bodies repeatedly showed for two weeks that it's the case. They finally decided not to build it. More importantly, they said, you know, we asked them how much lead time do you want to build such a field? And they said about six weeks. So from then on, every week we give them a uh, projection about six weeks. And these are not accurate predictions of a typical kind, it just tells you whether hospital capacity is going to go by the car. Uh, and they never had to build serious facility. Uh, and six weeks was based on the National Guard's efforts to build such a project. Second, other thing we told them was if to the extent you have to build one, you should not build a large facility like the last session. We told them that we should build mobile, nimble facilities because epidemic constantly moves. There's no use of building a big mammoth hospital in Washington, D.C., and then having the thing move Richmond. So you should be able to move this. The third thing we told them is to the extent you build one, see whether you can build it close to existing hospitals. So now that's what they do in most places. They build these 10 hospitals in the parking lots. Turns out well, logistics are just easier in terms of sharing nurses, hospitals, and equipment. So this really saved our state between 60 and 100 million dollars. Uh, and I think personally for us, it was a huge success story. There was, and the last success story, another success story we stop, is one where we, we helped the state come up with ways to help them distribute the vaccines in the initial state. And we use data-driven approaches to do this. They use this to place the vaccine distribution sites. It's a location in question, it turns out. And we can only solve the accessibility plan. If people don't take vaccine because they don't want to take it, that's not what we can solve. What we can do is we can make it easy for people to reach. And we use data from mobility graphs that are good safe graph. And we did this work with UNS Covid at Stanford. We were able to tell them where this place mobile sites. But again, we use mobile sites. We used to move them around in the state where we felt things were not being covered there. We also tried to help them to reach marginalized population, population of African Americans and Hispanic community that, that oftentimes could not reach because they had a stage. So I will uh, skip this. I want to tell you what we're doing. We're doing building digital twins for our group. This, the whole effort here, the agent based models, was based on this idea of synthetic networks that you all have built as well. And now we have finished making such a print for US, fairly detailed one. But we are trying to add other features. We just had a paper DNS with Vince and others to build an electrical grid, which we have added other, other information to it. We're starting to work on that part. And I close by saying one slide. Anyways, there is a, I don't know how many of you. Are participating, that, but this is, I think, a good success for our work on pandemics and the community. US UK running a price challenge of privacy and non technology. And uh, we are providing data to that challenge. The idea is to build privacy enhancing technologies uh, so that they can be deployed in practice. So, two data sets, we all can participate in it now, but one on financial fraud and one on epidemics. And we gave them the data from UK and US. It's a simulated pandemic, and they want to try and build these privacy observing apps that will try and estimate the individual risks. Uh, we all know that's our problem, but the idea was if these apps can be deployed without having to share this information directly, then can we try and get a set for the, for the county to do the sun? And I'm sorry, it took a little bit more time, but um, I'll summarize. This has been a journey for us. It's ongoing, and I really appreciate the efforts, the collaborations with you all here, uh, and also the folks that have come here from ISAF. It a really amazing work. And then uh, Shreeni, Abhijan, Anurta, and Rami, uh, four members of our team, and a lot of this work. And we can take questions later on if you want, given the time, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. So in that uh, two, so t is equal to two Markov chain. Uh, there is one uh, thing that happens when the Markov chain is larger than you have a somewhat large number of agents. Uh, that is that it becomes near deterministic. 
in two steps, you kind of can expect where to go. So it looks like the question that you're asking is a very precise question of bigger than or equal to Q. But if you ask for approximate correctness, not exact answer, but maybe an approximate correct answer, uh, that is 98% of the time it should be correct. Then perhaps that might be a simpler simpler idea. We never studied it. Uh, we you know where we saw more and more traditional computer science. Uh, so this remains, I think it remains open for us. We also have not done the classical question, just estimating the number. You know, you can do this over and over again and do the average sample average approximation to do this, but that does not have two theoretic values. But good point that I think we can. I'm just thinking of uh, yeah. E is a deterministic limit. Then yes. you can just let it let yeah. only run and be able to get it. Yeah, right. yeah. So this one, so you know, this, but so you might have to bring the shrink the time also to small steps, which means p larger than or equal to some large value. Okay, so there might be After something. Of, so maybe the unpredictability will reaching from small time to a medium time, and after that, things again become okay. You, we know that after some time, the system does need to fix for it. Either everybody is recovered, but this system always has a fixed point. So, and at about n steps, or you know, depending on integration period, after 20 steps, the system does need to fix for it. But you're talking about something better than that, I guess. Yeah, so you saved uh, 50 to $100 million. Did you ask for a time for? Uh, Funding for your funds? You know, we, uh, you know, we've asked them, they'll be trying to fund us. Hmm. Um, and these are estimates that we hospital to make. And we, they, they have, they have acknowledged that the press articles in this required that we need to hospital on the And the number comes because it takes a number of effort to time to build this. Uh, but I, I think we haven't been successful in getting that much money for us, but uh, it just seemed. Uh, no, it was risky, risky move because we've been wrong. But the models that showed it over and over again, uh, and in intuition matter, because this parameterization of the models was not important. But I think that what it did was they, they failed these models in group computation. So that's why they were able to stay for two and a half years now. I'm here to say that I think it's really good to include the talk. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, as discussed before, we would like to remind the audience to subscribe to our Google Groups, which is the mailing list for information on future talks. You can also visit our website for more details. The links to the slides and the recorded video will be available on the webpage. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much.